Matthew chapter 4. And we're going to introduce a new character today, an antagonist. Could it be Satan? <laughs> the third enemy that Matthew has introduced so far. The third enemy. So we're in chapter 4 of the book of Matthew, and we've got four enemies. The first we saw right away in chapter 1. Jesus came to save us from ourselves. So the first enemy to our relationship with God introduced right away at the beginning of the gospel. Remember, you're sitting there. Remember we set the scene. You're sitting in this first century church. You received the gospel of Matthew for the first time, and the, and the pastors are reading it out to the congregation. And right away you see that Christ came to save us from ourselves. And if you have the Holy Spirit, you already know you're not the person you wish you were. You already know that God's standard is so good and so perfect and that we fall short. And so when you hear Jesus came, and, and in other religions I, I polish myself up and I look really good, and if I'm good enough, maybe I'll deserve God's credit. And right away you hear, no, he came and he went to the cross to save us from ourselves. And what a, what a refreshing and beautiful message that is right off the bat in chapter 1. We are our own worst enemies. Can I get an amen? amen? Amen. We are our own worst enemies. That's why That's why. even little kids, they have their BFF. That's not the Beloit Film Festival. It's a best friends forever. Uh, little kids have a hard time not fighting with each other. That's why in junior high and high school, Friendships can be so difficult. We're our own worst enemy. That's why marriage can be difficult. I love, I, I told you I'm becoming more romantic the older I get. I love marriage. I love, I love the ridiculousness of two people that don't really know each other that well, how long they've been knowing each other, six months, two years, who, whatever. And for some reason, they look into each other's eyes and say, let's spend the rest of our lives together. And the other person says, okay. <laughs> and they do it. And I think that's awesome because there's going to be two people who are going to go through a lot of difficult time together. And if we do it God's way, you know, we're not going to give up on each other. We keep fighting. We keep pressing. But marriage is difficult. You know, when I went to Japan as a missionary, doesn't that sound cool? I was a missionary. I'm a pastor. You know what? I traveled across the Pacific, and I brought my baggage with me. Still a sinner. Still need grace. Marriage is difficult because we're our own worst enemy. Life is difficult because we're our own. We are our own worst enemies. That's why simply being good can be difficult. People that are always given in to sin right away, sometimes we're there, have no idea how difficult it is to be good. A good person understands temptation more than a bad person because a bad person gives in before they feel the weight. But you're trying to be good. You're trying to be patient. You're trying to be kind. You're trying to be there for others. You're, you're trying to put away greed and lust and all these things, and it keeps coming back on you. And it's just so hard just to be good. I want to be a good. I want to be a good husband. I want to be a good friend. I want to be a good dad, good citizen. And we struggle with the weight, the gravity of our own sin nature Keep pulling us down from where we want to go. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 15.33, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Isn't that simple? Isn't that simple? And isn't that beautiful? Bad company corrupts good character. So I heard one old pastor say, bad company corrupts good character. That's why I try not to spend too much time alone. And I thought there's, there's a lot of wisdom there. When you get alone, you can get pouty. 
You can get self-righteous, get depressed, you can start to justify a lot of bad attitudes, bad behavior. Jeremiah 17.9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So it's like God versus Disney. Because isn't that the, the theme of almost every Disney movie? You've just got to, I almost feel like I should sing it. Just follow your heart, you know. Just go where your heart leads you. And the Bible says, whoa, 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 whoa. Your heart is going to lead you some pretty nasty places. And I can't buy that line, just follow your heart, because I know myself way too well. And if I just follow my heart, amen, I'm seeing people's heads nodding, pointing at themselves. If I just follow my heart, I can justify a lot of bad attitudes. This person has it coming because boom, 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 boom. Meanwhile, try to avoid Christ's eyes. Don't look at Jesus. When you want to stay angry with somebody, the last thing you do, this is just some personal advice. Please don't pray. Because if you really want to stay ornery and nasty, the last thing you want to do is pray. Because then God's going to start dealing with your heart. That's one way you can know you really believe in the power of prayer. Because how fast do you want to avoid it when you've got something you don't want to pray about? No, we know prayer works. I can't buy into the line, just follow your heart, because I buy into this book that says my heart is deceitful and wicked above everything else. I want to follow his heart. You know, he went to the cross for me. That's a pretty good heart to follow. He didn't sin. That's a pretty good heart to follow. He gave his life away for you and me. That's a pretty good heart to follow. I want to be more like that. The second enemy that Matthew introduces to us is the world. The world. It's a rough place that we're born into. Everybody, I don't care if you're born in the Humboldt Park or, or the best neighborhood in Janesville, we're all born into a rough neighborhood. This world is a rough neighborhood. All those beautiful houses, we have beautiful houses in the United States. It's winter and we're warm at home. And inside, a lot of sadness, a lot of betrayal, a lot of hurt, a lot of yelling and screaming, a lot of things that just shouldn't be. In chapter 2, we see that the world is corrupt. We see that the government in King Herod is corrupt. We see injustice. We see cruelty. We see murder of, of children. We see poverty. And we see a young family on the life because on the run, remember they had to run down to Egypt? Why? Because life isn't fair. But Mary did the right thing and Joseph obeyed God. Why do they have to run? Life isn't fair. Why did those little children get murdered by, the, by King Herod when they had nothing to do with the birth of Christ? Because this world is broken and messed up and life isn't fair. In the book of Matthew, and even throughout the entire New Testament, we're going to see the phrase, the world. The world a lot. And it's used, when the Bible says the world, it doesn't mean planet Earth. It means it used to refer to everything that's wrong with human society. Everything that's wrong and broken about human, when we, when we built together, we've come together, what's broken about it, that's the world. The first enemy is ourselves. That's the flesh. The second enemy is society. That's the world. So when you hear the Bible talk about the flesh and the world, it's actually kind of simple. I'm talking about we're a problem and everybody else is a problem. I'm okay, you're okay, you ever heard that? I'm not okay. And you're not okay. Because of the cross, that's okay. Jesus famously says in Matthew 16, 26, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? The answer is, 
that would be a very, very bad deal because Christ is giving us so much more than this world can offer. The more we get, the more we have to worry about losing. The more we get, the more we want. This world, the reason is this world cannot satisfy. It wasn't made to satisfy. That's not its point. Fame, popularity, a little bit more in the bank, bigger house, bigger car, bigger wife. These things are not going to satisfy. 1 John 2, 15-17, Do not love the world, nor the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, for everything that's in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away, and also its lusts. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. It's a contrast. And are you going to buy what the world is selling? Or are you going to fall in love with Jesus and move that direction? And it's not just a one-time thing. Every day of our lives, we're going to be tempted to buy into the world's values of what's really important. How should I spend my money? How should I spend my time? What should I use my life for? It's either going to be the world or it's going to be God. Those are the two choices. And now, yet a third enemy is revealed. So it's not bad enough, right? It's not bad enough that I bring my own baggage wherever I go. It's not bad enough that not only am I imperfect, but, oh, man, everybody else around me is a sinner too. How dare they? It's not bad enough that I'm messed up and our culture's messed up. We've got a third enemy And he's a tempter. He wants to tempt you to despair. He wants to tempt you to give up. He wants to tempt you to just pitch it all. He's a liar, John 8.44. 2 Corinthians 2.11 says that he plots to outwit us. Satan, the enemy, wants to outsmart you, wants to outsmart me. He wants to mess up your family. He wants to mess up your church. He wants to mess up our country. And he's trying. He's plotting. And we just kind of whistle and go along, and everything falls apart all around us, and we're surprised. Later in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 12-15, the Bible says that he and those who are following him, you know, not in the sense that they're worshiping Satan, but they're buying into his, they're buying what the devil's selling. The Bible says that those and those who follow his path often try to appear like good guys. So Satan, that joke I told at the beginning with the pitchfork and the spiky tail, that's not Satan. Satan's the smooth guy with the nice haircut on television. I'm telling you why. This isn't so important. All you need is self-will. All you need to do is be a self-made man. Satan is going to look like he's got all the answers. Revelation 12.10 says he's an accuser. You know, there's two kinds of guilt that we can feel the Bible teaches us. When, we, when we're messed up, when we're treating people badly, when our heart is a million miles away from God, we're going to feel bad if we have the Holy Spirit in us. The Bible says that this kind of godly guilt is going to lead us to repentance. It's not there to push us down. It's there to pull us back up, to let us know we're on the wrong track. It's not there to beat us up. It's there to help us turn to where we can get an embrace from God. But there's another kind of guilt And that comes from Satan. And Satan says, you're not good enough to be a Christian. You're not good enough to be like everybody else in this church. If people really knew what's going on in your heart, they wouldn't love you. God doesn't want you. God's tired of you. Do you know the guy who says God doesn't want you, God's tired of you, is not God? (laughs) 
God wouldn't say that. He's the one who died for you. Again, that's right. That's the bad guy. There you go. Give him a Zerbert. Satan in Revelation 12.10 is called the accuser. And he's not, he doesn't give up easy. In your entire life, he's going to be telling you you're not good enough. You're worthless. 1 Peter 5.8 says he's a devourer. He's going to eat up your family, going to eat up your joy, going to eat up your peace, going to eat up your love, going to destroy everything. You know, there's so many verses on Satan, and I thought, you know, I really don't want to focus on him today, so I think that's enough. He's bad. He doesn't have anything that we want. See, when we... Let's read chapter 4. First 11 verses. Matthew chapter 4. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Imagine that. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, People do not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. And and, uh, scholars say if he was standing on the edge of the temple uh, that was near the city wall that's by a cliff that goes over, they were over 450 feet in the air. So they're way, way up there. The devil took him to a, uh, I'm sorry, the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. They will lift you up uh, uh, in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered and said, It is also written, Do not put the Lord our, your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And then the devil left him, and angels came. And attended him. There's so much to unpack there. So much that we can see in there. One, I wanted to focus on right away that Christ is, is fasting. When he's fasting, he's, he's physically beat up. He's physically tired. I think a lot of times when we're exhausted, when life is really beating us up, uh, when, we're, uh, when we're hungry, when we've been too busy, that's when temptation really hits. It's harder to be patient then. It's, it's harder to resist uh, all, the, all the lies that the devil has us. It's an opportunity, though, to glorify God. I'm suffering. Oh, that's an opportunity to glorify God. Well, why, why is that? I'm really, really hurting today. I'm so lonely. I'm so tired. It's an opportunity to glorify God. See, there's only a handful of good things that we can do here on earth that we can't do in heaven. Did you know that? When we get to heaven, there's some things that are good that we can't do anymore. When we get to heaven, we're not going to be able to evangelize anymore. You ever think about that? All the evangelizing you're going to do in all of eternity is going to take place right now, right down here. In just this little blip of time. If you want to honor God by telling people about Jesus Christ, don't wait. Do it now. Do it now. Because we can't do that in heaven. And the other, one of the other things, is bringing glory to, to God by the way we face hardship in this life. Can't do that in heaven because there will be no hardship. So, when life is really beating you up, you're not happy when you look at your bank book. You look around and there's a lot of broken relationships around you and you're not happy. When you feel like people can't understand you, nobody understands you. When you're just sick of your temper, you're just sick of the way alcohol or drugs keeps calling you back. When you're just sick of the greed or the lust in your heart. It's an opportunity to glorify God.
because you say, with all the pain all around me, all the difficult, all the darkness, I'm going to hold on to Jesus. And I'm going to follow him. And I'm going to love him. And I'm going to love other people. And I'm not going to give up. In heaven, it's not difficult. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to give up. No, it's easy. Right now, we point to Jesus. We were talking about this a little bit in Sunday school class this morning. By doing the right thing, even when we don't feel like it. It brings glory to God, and we can do that right now. So when we're suffering, when we're having that hard time, say, God, this is an opportunity for you to do something because I want to be a blessing to the people around me, and I want to honor you in this trial. Suffering while extending peace to others in hope and joy is supernatural. And I don't know, maybe one of you said it. I don't know who said it. I heard it recently. But when there's something supernatural and God's working through us, he provides the super, we provide the natural. It's supernatural. But suffering, again, opens an opportunity for Satan. Uh, hungry, when you're hungry, isn't it easier to be angry, cranky, impatient? I'm hungry. As if that gives me a right to be less than I'm called to be. We kind of make, we teach people that, we teach children that. Oh, they're sleepy, so therefore. They're hungry, oh, therefore. And we grow up and we buy that lie. Now I'm 20 years old, I'm sleepy, so I'm cranky. I'm 30 years old, I'm hungry, so I'm cranky. I'm 40 years old, there's no batteries in my remote control, so I'm cranky. Because my flesh, my body cries. Feed me, feed me. I'm so weak, I'm so cold, I'm so hot. Whatever. I would do anything to avoid suffering. Have you heard people say that? I'm allergic to pain. I would do anything to avoid another broken rule. I would avoid anything to, to just get rid of this hurt in my heart, this pain. Or more seriously, feelings of bitterness. Bitterness is a bitter pill to swallow. When we're bitter... It changes the way we see the world. This sunshine didn't seem so bright for you this morning if you're carrying a load of bitterness. Resentment, everything is heavy. Everything is dark. Depression. Some people go through life with very little depression. That's wonderful. When you're depressed, a flight of stairs seems like it's too much to get up. Taking another breath seems like hard work. Immobilizing fear. Some people are more fearful than others. They're immobilized. They're afraid to do anything because they're waiting for the next shoe to drop. What's going to happen next? And it robs them of joy and peace and happiness in our walk with the Lord. Loneliness. So lonely you can be lonely with your husband sleeping right next to you. You can be lonely in a crowd full of people. Horrible things to endure. And when we lose our focus on God, we can tell ourselves some horrible lies. Since life has dealt me such a bad hand, I'm going to do whatever I want. Since, since life has been so unfair to me, I'm just going to give up. I'm just going to give up. Why try anymore? What has following God gotten me anyway? And that's when the empty promises of the world, our own sin nature, and the devil all get together and cooperate to force this wedge of doubt between us and God. And next thing we know, we're angry at God, the one who died for us, the one who loves us, the one who opened up heaven's doors, the one who says, follow me, I love you, I want you to love other people, and it's just going to be a short time, and then you're going to be with me forever. And we're like this. Where's my... Mansion, where's my better job? <clears throat> Why do all my relationships turn out like this? <clears throat> Why am I praying and I'm still sick? And we start to think that we deserve better than what God has given us. God's given us life. God's given us love. He's given us a cross. <clears throat> He's given us forgiveness for every 
nasty, selfish thing we've ever done. He's given us heaven, and that ain't enough. And when we feel wronged, ill-used, we're capable of anything. We can justify any nasty, wretched attitude. That doesn't end well. Right? Never has for me. Jesus resisted Satan with the word. We get this model in chapter 4 where Satan tempts Jesus and Jesus responds with what? Scripture. We need to fill up our heart with these truths. We need to fill up our mind with these truths so that when, when bitterness and loneliness and depression and sadness and this heaviness of life come to us, we can respond with the word of God. Jesus resisted Satan with the Bible, and it ended with Satan in retreat in the angels ministering to him. Isn't that, isn't that nice to know, the conclusion? We resist it, we resist, we resist, and then Satan is in retreat, and the angels are ministering. I think too often we don't get to the place of rest, at least in my life, because we cave in too early. And again, our own flesh, the world, and Satan are, Satan are enemies of our faith. Dad pointed out, uh, this week, that when Satan offers Christ the kingdoms of the world, you know, Jesus didn't dispute with them. Jesus didn't say, hey, wait a second, those kingdoms aren't yours. You can't give them. No, he didn't argue with that at all. Satan is the god of this world. Did you know that? That's not blasphemy. He, uh, he's a false god. But 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the Bible says that Satan is the god of this messed up world. You know, that messed up society I was talking about? Guess who their boss is? That's the devil. That's right. Let's look at the ways in which the devil tried to tempt Jesus. One, temptation number one, if you're God, prove it. Provide food. Isn't that a way we're often tempted? Okay, if you're real, do things my way. If you are the God who created the universe, prove it by obeying me. <laughs> do it, jump, start, start jumping, God. I got some hoops. And I would like food. I would like a bigger house. I would like, and the list goes on, because oftentimes we think God is Santa Claus, right? He's just Santa Claus in the sky. If you're God, prove it. If you're God, give me what I want. In the answer that Jesus provides to this temptation, he said we need spiritual food. Physical food alone is not enough. God's answer to give me, give me, give me, it says, God says that's not going to be enough for you. You need me. The answer to this temptation is we need God. Look at the next way that Satan tempts him. He says, Satan says, take a risk. God's going to send his angels to protect you anyways. You don't need to be wise. You don't need to be careful because God has your back. And the answer is, do not put the Lord your God to the test. I could just do whatever I want to, with my life. Because God's going to put it all back together. God will take care of the pieces. And the Bible says God, God's answer is don't put God to the test. Uh, another story about Korea. If In Korea, boy, the taxi drivers are crazy. And, and the driving is just insane. In, in Seoul, we were in Seoul, and I was with my good friend, Keisuke Goda, and I put his name in there because he listens to some of the sermons. Keisuke, you heard your name in the sermon in, in the United States, so here you go. Uh, another good friend, Mr. Lee, and a gal named Min Young Duck. And Min Young Duck was in the front seat of the taxi, and we came to an intersection, and we wanted to turn left, and there was cars in front of us. And they decided to stop because the light turned red. And our taxi driver saw that traffic hadn't started moving yet, and oncoming traffic was stopped, so he pulled out into the lane of oncoming traffic to get around in the left lane. And Min Young Duck didn't have her seatbelt on. I said, you probably should think about putting your seatbelt on. She said, she's a good Christian gal. She said, oh, God will protect me. Now, the thing is, some of you know this story. She had just come out of the hospital. She had been in the hospital for a couple months in traction because of a car accident. Well, God's given you a brain, too. Don't put the Lord your God to the test. He provided a seatbelt. Use it. Don't put the Lord your God to the test is the answer to that temptation. Temptation number three, Satan says, this is a 
this is power. Satan saved his most powerful temptation for last. I'll give you anything you want. I'll make it easy. Because if Jesus got the kingdoms of the world, what did that mean? He doesn't have to go to the cross. He doesn't have to suffer to accomplish God's will. Satan says, I'll give you everything you want. It's going to be easy. No suffering involved. Just worship me. Buy in. Bow down. And we say, hold on. That sounds pretty good. Let me put that on TV so people can send me money. The answer is, get out of here. Be gone. Worship God alone. Stop worshiping stuff. Stop looking for the easy way out. The Bible says in Colossians 3, 5, that greed is idolatry. Serve God alone. And there is no easy path in this life. And when we <coughs> buy into this easy idea, this easy mentality, we're often worshiping a God of our own creation. <coughs> Here's another thing that's interesting about these three temptations. Satan's grabbing from all over the New Te uh, Old Testament. <coughs> Jesus counters Satan by quoting from Deuteronomy each time. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy. I think another temptation that we often have is to see the Old Testament has got this angry, nasty God, and the law is really boring. Remember the first churches didn't have the New Testament yet? That's why Matthew came to them. Matthew came to them the first time. The, the letters of Paul came to them the first time. They were studying from the Old Testament. The law is not portrayed as boring or, or legalistic because it's the law in the Old Testament. The, the law is portrayed as life-giving, and Jesus handles the devil by quoting from the book of Deuteronomy three times. And when we took all those years to go through the Bible, to go through the Old Testament slowly, what did we see? It's the same God throughout the entire Bible, and there is life and there is grace right there in the Old Testament, right there in the law, the law uh, of God. Same God. It's all good. Okay, a few thoughts to wrap up. Uh, when I was writing this uh, message, first started thinking about it on Sunday, and then uh, got an outline for it on Tuesday, but I had to alter that a bit because it started to change. The first thing I did when I, when I got to this uh, M Matthew 4, first 11 verses, I thought, okay, how do we fight temptation? Let's look at fighting temptation. And the more I studied it, I saw that's definitely there. The Bible says, resist Satan and he will flee from you. <coughs> We're supposed to be involved in this process. We know it's just that, that let go and let God, there's an element of truth there. But the Bible continually calls us, God's calling us into a partnership with him that we do our part. We're supposed to resist. That's an active idea. And I'm looking through these first 11 verses, and, and I see that God, Jesus is providing a model how to resist temptation. It's good, it's good, it's good. Uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit more. But the more I started looking at it, the more I started to see for that first church sitting there, what they are seeing is Jesus Christ is greater than Satan. What they're seeing, they know their lives, how often they've given in to temptation. They know how often they've stumbled, and they look, and Jesus didn't give in. Jesus didn't sin. And how they must have celebrated, and how excited they would have been to hear this story. Brothers and sisters, I think we need to be more excited about the God we follow. We need to be more excited about how where we fail, Jesus succeeds and he is victorious. And he went to the cross not because we're so perfect and we deserve it. He went to the cross because God knows that we do fail. And so God comes along. Jesus Christ came to gather us in, gather us to his side, bring us close to him. We fight lies with truth. It's important to know Scripture. Temptation is fought moment by moment. Jesus didn't answer the devil once and that was finished. It came again and then a different temptation. Then a different temptation. When temptation comes, brothers and sisters, don't despair because you failed yesterday and last week and the month before and two years before and you've been failing. 
Don't despair based on past history. The past doesn't have power over how we're going to react this time. With God, all things are possible. And don't despair under the weight of future temptation. I think that's a burden that's very difficult for us sometimes. We look at future temptation. Oh, fine, I'm not going to take a drink this time, but what are the odds I'm not going to take a drink for the next 30 years? And I've had this problem, it's ruined my life, this, you know, whatever the temptation is. Don't let the past hold you down and don't let the future. What we have to worry about is right here, right now. Am I going to deny my flesh? Am I going to say no to the devil? Or am I going to follow Jesus right here, right now? The past doesn't matter. The future is still the future. We deal with temptation right here in the moment. Our job is each day, moment by moment, to deny our flesh and accept God's will in each situation and trust that God will give us grace and power to gain victory at that time. We need to thank God for Christ's victory. Again, because we fail, we fall short. But the perfect person in the Bible, the only perfect person is God. The only person who never sinned is Jesus Christ. So let's have more celebration. I believe Christians, we need more celebration. We need more joy. More thankfulness because God has been so good to us. And we see right here in the first 11 verses a good God who didn't fail. He's different. He's different, and that's a good thing. 1 John 3.8 tells us that Jesus came to destroy the work of the devil. That's why the devil hates Jesus, and he hates you and I. He hates everybody who's following Jesus because Jesus has it out for him. And Jesus, the devil wants to destroy families, and Jesus wants to build them up. The devil wants to destroy our children and take them away. And Jesus wants to bring our children up to him. The devil wants us to be miserable, angry, bitter, broken. And Jesus Christ wants to make us whole. And he sends us the Holy Spirit. So we could walk with him every day of our lives. See, God has a plan. And it's a good plan. His will for us, what he wants us to do, he wants us to be filled up with love so it's overflowing. We just love and adore him. And we have so much love in us that we're, we're patient and loving and kind and gentle to the people around us. And we, we stop talking like the world. And we stop valuing the things of the world. We stop, buy, we stop buying the devil's lies that only end in destruction and misery because God's plan is better. My flesh, the world, and this ancient wicked spirit, this fallen angel, hates God's plan. If the devil hates it, I like it. Jesus gave us a pattern to get Satan out of our lives and out of our families and out of our church. In James 4, 7, the Bible says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Isn't that a beautiful promise? I want to end. Foundation Bible Church. Inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.